Hi friends, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, today I'm blessed to have as our guest two-time Dove Award winner, Billy Gaines. And Billy is a talented singer, songwriter, and ordained minister who has numerous number one and top 10 hits. He's been featured on recordings with numerous artists, including Pivo Bryson, Vanessa Williams, Cece Winans, Amy Grant, DC Talk, Carmen, Nicole Mullen, and many more. He recently wrapped a filming and recording project with Kathy Lee Givert that will be released in theaters next year. Welcome, Billy. Debbie, thank you so much for inviting me. I really appreciate it. Oh, glad, glad to be here. Glad we can finally make this happen. So Absolutely. Um, the reason, one of the reasons I wanted to have you is because um, I'm familiar with your story a little bit and things you've gone through. And I know that um, that a lot of my followers can relate to things that you've had to deal with in life. And you have such, um, well, you're a minister, you're well grounded in the word. I know that has helped you to deal with things, but um, I, I feel like maybe you could also offer some tangible things for people to do uh, to get through grief and loss. So um, I'm just going to let you share your story a little bit and, and then we'll get into it and I'll ask you some questions if that sounds all right. Okay, absolutely. Well, uh, you know, I've had some compounded grief, I call it, because, you know, I lost uh, uh, my second wife, Christy, uh, and a year later, Sarah, who was my former wife. And, um, you know, I, I found myself being that person. I would look at someone going through the things that I went through, and I would typically say, well, I really feel sorry for that guy. You know what I mean? But I found myself never imagining that I would ever be that guy that people would pity. And I, I would look at and pity and say, man, it must be horrible. I can't imagine what it's like. Well, well, I became that person. And I became that person with the unimaginable grief that had happened to me. And like I said, it was compounded grief because it was one thing after another. <clears throat> First of all, it was, you know, the discovery that Christy, well, it's just, just really one of the most bizarre things that could ever happen you know, Christy was sick and I had, you know, suggested that, you know, because she was feeling so bad one day, I said, look, we've got to go and see what in the world is going on with you. So we went to the emergency room and uh, while we were there in the emergency room, they had told us that they saw a shadow on her pancreas. And, um, well, actually before that, what had actually happened was we had gone in for a scan and uh, we were waiting for the results of that scan. So while we were waiting for the results of that scan and what it would show, I get a call from my daughter, Rachel. And Rachel tells me, uh, Daddy, um, Mommy didn't want anybody to know this, but she really doesn't care now because she is really sick and she has, she's dying of, of lung cancer and she just wants everybody to pray. I was just absolutely knocked over. And... I turned to Christy and told her what Rachel had just told me. Christy just basically said, oh, that is just not good. And in a matter of minutes, uh, the technician came into the examining room where we were sitting and told us that uh, they saw a shadow on her pancreas and that they wanted her to have a biopsy. <clears throat> I'm telling you, uh, the, the grief that fell on me so suddenly actually made me ill. And it began to, it created this pain in my neck. The next day I was, I mean, it was like this sudden jolt that just hit my spirit, my soul, my body and everything. The next day my neck was so, uh, was in such pain that I, I had to cancel a job that I was getting ready to do. And um, from that point, you know, we were really hoping that, uh, that there would be, Christy was hoping, hoping in this, what they called the Whipple, this was a Whipple procedure where they cut off a part of the pancreas and they're able to, you know, to cut the, the cancerous part off. And so we went in for a needle biopsy and we were all, you know, Christy and her 
her sister and her brother-in-law and Chrissy's mom and the kids were all sitting in the lobby area, you know, outside of the, you know, outside of the uh, endoscopy lab. And when the doctor came out to talk to us, I nearly fell on the floor when the doctor said, uh, it is pancreatic cancer and it is inoperable and it is terminal. Mm. And uh, boy, you talk about, I just fell apart. If, I, if someone wasn't, wasn't there to, to embrace me, I probably would have fell on the floor, you know? So the whole process of that, you know, uh, that began, you know, going through chemo and going to the, you know, to the chemotherapist and the doctor basically just telling her straight up, well, I can't cure you, but I can extend your life. And that hit like a ton of bricks also. I mean, it's just everything about this just seems so hopeless. Still praying and believing that God would do some kind of miracle. And um, so started the process of chemotherapy. And so there was the, you know, we live in Gainesville and we're traveling back and forth to, to Atlanta, you know, a couple of times a week. And um, chemotherapy sitting there with her. And, you know, then, you know, I was very fortunate to have a friend who, you know, gave me a, basically a month's salary so that I wouldn't have to work. I could be there to care for her. So the wonderful part about all of this was that I was able to serve her and be with her every day for a whole month. But after that time, I had to go back to work. So that compounded it also. So through all of these things, I can remember, you know, now with the, with the knowledge of Sarah being sick, you know, and traveling up to Nashville to see her at Rachel's house and all of these things just fell on me like, it was just absolutely un unimaginable. And I can remember driving back and forth uh, from the hospital back to Gainesville. And I'm telling you, I mean, well, just basically every day I, I drove on Highway 400. And every day I drove on that highway, I cried. And I thought to myself, there's somebody who's going to see me crying every day. And they're going to say, there's this crazy man who comes by here crying every day. I mean, that's what I felt. Um, but it was, like I said, it was an, just an absolutely amazing grief for me. And then, you know, watching her as she deteriorated, you know, uh, caring for her, uh, you know, having to uh, you know, give her a bath and different things like that. And uh, her, you know, losing an enormous amount of weight. And then finally, you know, January the 25th, of 2018 when she went home to be with the Lord. And, you know, the very next day, I don't know, you know, I've lost a lot of people. I've had a lot of grief happen in my life. But the next day, the next, the morning of her funeral, well, two things that were really very hard for me also was that having to go in and having to choose a casket, something I've never done. Of all, all the people, of everybody in my family that's ever passed away, it's always been somebody else who did that because that, I hated the idea of doing something like that. I just didn't want any part of it. But here I now, I've got to do it now. And that was one of the hardest things I've ever, I've ever done in my life. I mean, I broke down like a baby in the office of the, of the mortician. And uh, so the morning of a funeral, uh, when I got up, when I woke up this, that morning, there was a weight on me it was the heaviest that I had ever felt in my life. Literally, I felt like I, I felt like I actually couldn't even sit up. I mean, I really had to pray, Lord, just help me just to get up out of this bed because I don't even feel like moving. I feel so horrible. Went through the day, through the funeral, and an amazing thing happened, though. Um, you know, we, the viewing, you know, that they had before the funeral where a lot of people were filing in and out and everything. You know, here again, I just, I mean, seeing her in that casket just, Oh my goodness! I don't, I, I don't wish it on anybody, but it happens to all of us at some point. But I mean, here again, the grief was just absolutely overwhelming. But we went in for the service, and uh, a, a Debbie Palmer was playing piano, and she had a group of people who were singing. And I'm telling you something. In that moment, when those when those songs started, there was something that lifted off of me that was absolutely unimaginable. And, and the power of the, of the singing, of the praise and the worship, worship of God just put me in a whole com 
completely different mindset as to what was really going on. And I, I mean, I didn't feel joyous by any means, but there was something there was something so comforting in middle and uh, something so uh, soothing about that that made me realize the power of the Holy Spirit also but the power of the Holy Spirit through music and particularly through praise. And that would be a pivotal part in my coping with the grief in the future also. You know, after that was all said and done, uh, like I said, I'd been through grief before. And in some ways I felt like, you know, I look back to when my mom died and when my nephew, when the, I guess the greatest, the worst thing ever happened to me was my nephew who was 15 years old. I was 18 at the time and he drowned trying to save his mom. That was the hardest grief I'd ever gone through, worse than anything I'd ever been through. But I never would have imagined that losing Christy would be even worse than that. And I can tell you that I had what I call protracted grief. Um, I know I must have cried every day for a year. And it wasn't that I wanted to cry. It was that uh, this ball of grief that would just sit in my chest just became so great that it, it seems like when I cried, that was the relief valve. That was the like the pop-off valve for the pressure that was, that was inside of my soul, you know? And so, you know, um, that, and then with that being the case, you know, after that, um, around March of 20, March of 2018, uh, Sarah began to get really sick again. So now I'm grieving over, uh, over Christy. I had moved back to Nashville at this time. And I'm visiting Sarah in the hospital because, you know, one thing after another was happening that was going, going back with her. And uh, it was around September, it was September the 17th, somewhere around there that um, she had gone in for surgery and I was supposed to be there. My daughter, Rachel, had asked me to go and get her something from her favorite restaurant. She was going in for surgery and she wanted me to get her something so that she, because she knew she would be hungry when she came out of, the surgery and recovery. So I'm in the room that she's supposed to come back to after recovery. And I bought this meal that Rachel told me to buy for her. And when they, when they wheel Sarah into this room, I can tell she's just, there is something really wrong. Something has gone wrong. She's not, um, she's not conscious. The doctors are working friendly, frantically on her. And they basically tell me I need to leave. And then she remained in that state for a whole month. And she finally began to come out of it slowly and she had lost pretty much every function uh, physically and mentally. Well, here I am grieving, you know, over the situation with, with, um, with Christy. And now I'm grieving over Sarah and it's all combined at the same time because she's sick and my kids, their hearts are aching. You know, they are, I, I'm looking at them and I just, I'm devastated because I know how much they're hurting. And, you know, it was a grief enough to have even, you know, lost my wife in divorce, you know, uh, which I never wanted in the first place. But it's like all these things are just piling up on me all at one time. And um, January, the, January the 17th of 2019, Sarah passed away. And so now I've got, you know, uh, two wives that I've lost and I'm living with this pain in my heart every day. And it really seems unshakable. And I really begin to cry and I begin to pray. I begin to cry out to the Lord and I begin to pray. And I said, Lord, I just, you just have to help me because this is, this grief and this anguish in my, my soul is just debilitating. It's like, I can't even think about anything else. I can't think straight because of all of what I'm feeling. And especially it would really come down on me uh, when I was alone, you know, that's when it seemed like it intensified. But I can remember there was, there was a day where I was praying and this scripture came to my mind for he was, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and by his stripes were healed. And, and that just rings so true to me. Uh, he was wounded for my transgressions. He was bruised for my iniquity. The chastisement of my peace was upon him. And by his stripes, he's healed. I just, and I, I realized in that moment that he died to bear my grief. He carried my grief. He had already carried my sorrows. And it really was a matter at this point 
of me being able to, to put my hope and my faith in what he has said and what he promised me. And I really had to trust him and say, Lord, I believe you that you have, that you have carried my sorrows, that you have carried my grace. And right now, Lord, as you told me to do before, I just surrender it all to you, Lord. I cast all my care on you because it's surely too heavy. It's surely too heavy for me. Surely, you Lord, you've promised that you that that if we come to you and if we're he if we're heavy laden, that we can take your yoke upon us and we can give our load to you. And it was amazing. I'm not trying to tell you that there was something that it didn't take away the, the knowledge of what had happened. It didn't change the fact that both of them were gone. But there was something that happened in my spirit that was so comforting that I knew that I had, I had turned a corner, if you will, towards really getting back to um, the, the place that God wanted me to be. Because I know that the Lord doesn't, he didn't, never wanted us to have the grief like those who have no hope. And the Lord brought me to that place, and, and I'm in that place right now. Yes, I'm still, I'm going to be honest with you, I'm so sad about it. I am. I still feel it. Yes, sometimes I still do cry about it, but but I'm not crying every day about it. And I'm living with it, but I'm living with it. And the other thing was the Lord showed me that in the same way that those songs affected me uh, during the service, that it was the praise that I was willing to offer up to him in the middle of all of what I was going through that would be one of the most essential elements of this whole process. And I thought, you know, on Job and all of what Job went through, and I realized he still went through more than what I went through. I mean, yes, I had my own set of circumstances, but Job worshiped God, God in, this, in the middle of his troubles. And I thought, you know, Lord, that's what I'm going to do. And I really began to do that. As a matter of fact, I even wrote a song about that whole situation. And uh, so here I walk in the comfort of the Holy Spirit and the comfort of his word. Like I said, my circumstances haven't, haven't changed, but my perception of those things, and especially my perception of God's grace and God's comfort and God's power in my life, it has changed drastically. So oh. I know it's a mouthful, but... <laughs> no, I'm... I know it's hard to, to talk about those things, but I know your heart is the same as mine. We want to comfort others with the comfort that we've received. And Absolutely. it's grief is, um, we don't say that, I, I mean, you never forget when, when there's great love there, that never goes away. You never lose that. And, um, but we know that our loved ones who have gone before us are, um, they're part of our future, you know, they're not just part of our past. Absolutely. And, um, and so we, we do, like you say, we grieve with hope and, and we do, you, you find yourself, um, at first you can't see your way out of the darkness, so to speak, but with, as you take steps like a praise and, and thinking on things that bring peace, like Philippians 4, 8 and 9 says, then we can, um, we'll find ourselves having more better, we'll have more better days and more and more. And pretty soon you'll go, wow, I went a whole week without crying or, you know, don't you right. agree that's how it works? Oh, no, without a doubt, no question about it. You know, another thing I just thought about that I want to mention is for people who are going through grief, especially if something has happened uh, recently. One of the things I realized was uh, well, I realized it's when my mom died, was the ability to concentrate sometimes. Something as simple as doing a checkbook. Yeah. Uh, to be able to focus. And it's just something that is it, like it, it diminishes your, I don't know what happens. All I know is it's hard to think. And sometimes it's good to have somebody help you do technical things because sometimes you just can't wrangle your mind in enough to do those things. Yeah. But here again, that uh, that's a part of the process also. Yes, it grief does a lot of people don't realize the physical um toll that grief takes and i'll i'll go ahead and when we share this video i'll put in the uh, links i have a video on the physical manifestations of grief and a lot of people don't know it impacts your sleep it impacts your thinking and um it's just i think that's what god created us that way is as a mechanism to help us cope with the trauma of what's gone on and and it does get better though and i'm sure you'll attest to that mm -hmm. 
Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. You know, Billy, um, I did have, I put out a, a request if people had any questions or topics that they wanted covered. And I have multiple people that um, are dealing with loved ones who have cancer. And one, one lady mentioned both her and her husband are dealing with cancer at the same time. And I know that um, as you've seen, I, I'm watching it with my father right now and, and several loved ones that have died this year. Um, it's hard to watch those we love suffer. And um, to me, that's worse than going through something myself. And you touched on that a little bit about watching your children. Could, could you talk to that about what helps when you're seeing loved ones suffering? Well, you know, here again, I mean, ultimately, there's a feeling of hopelessness because the one thing I can do for myself is that I can comfort, I can begin to speak to myself the word and everything else. But for my children, it was somewhat different, you know. Uh, they had a very close up view. My son, you know, each, as a matter of fact, Sarah stayed with my daughter Rachel for a while. And my son Jason spent quite a bit of time in the, uh, in her hospital room with her like overnight and he was there a couple of times when when she actually coded and they came in and I came in and I saw him one day and I just looked at him and I could see him getting ill and I just felt so sorry for him I could see it in his face I could see it in his skin and uh, he really just quite frankly he really just really needed a break it was just too much for him yeah. and sometimes that's what it takes uh you know, I guess you probably see some of the statistics of people who are longtime caretakers and even their mortality in association with illness and everything else, because it's just, um, you know, dealing with those things just creates a whole cascade of other things in other people's lives. So, and even now my kids, you know, uh, Rachel and, and Jason and Another thing I realized, you know, even with Rachel, sometimes the reason she wanted me to come over and get the kids was because she just needs to go somewhere and cry. Yeah. And I talked to my son a couple of months ago when he told me that uh, sometimes when he leaves out, when he leaves out, he's just going up to cry because he just, just got to get it out, you know. So yeah. So it is. Uh, it's real, you know. And around this time of year, I know it's really hard for for all of us, you know, Thanksgiving. Christmas, it seems like it just brings up everything almost in a fresh way, you know, so. Yeah. Did you, um, did you decide to, to do things differently uh, to get through the holidays or what, what, what have you done to help cope with the holidays? Well, I think the really just being around them makes all the difference in the world, you know. Mm -hmm. and my grandkids were a great comfort to me, you know. And I have family, you know, and I, I have someone to love me. And I mean, I can't imagine what it's like for people who don't have that support system. It's, it's got to be even even harder, you know. So, but I think that is our, our togetherness that's helped us all cope with it. Because you know? mm -hmm. we share the same, we share our common sorrow, you know, and, uh, but we still have each other. And I think you know, I think one of the comforting things Rachel tells you over and over, Daddy, I'm still, I'm glad you're still here, you know, wow. and, uh, and I'm there for, and I make an extra effort to be there even more for her now and for the kids, because I know, I, I feel like I need to do double duty because she doesn't, they don't have two grandparents. I mean, they have two others on Brian's side, but as it relates to Rachel, I'm, I'm it. So I really want to always be there. That's why if she calls me to pick the kids up from school, I, I will never tell her no. The only way I to ever tell her no is if I just absolutely couldn't do it. But if anything she asked me to do, I want to do it because I just want to be a comfort to her. And I know she feels comforted when I serve her. And for me, quite frankly, uh, that gives me a great sense of joy to serve her, to know that I'm helping her overcome her grief, you know? Yeah. yeah. I, I spoke with someone yesterday and she, um, she did say um, that she thinks that it helps to overcome grief by helping others. Absolutely. Yeah. Without a doubt. Yeah. Is there any, you quoted a couple of scriptures that you found helpful. Were there any others that, that really helped you to deal with your grief? 
Well, of course, you know, um, the, the scripture where it says, you know, that, you know, that the Lord will come back. I mean, I guess I can look it up right quick. But this one, let's see here. I guess I should have written this down before. And what uh, um, it basically says, um, comfort one another with these words. Mm-hmm. Um, Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 4 and 8. I'm going to read that right quick. Okay. All right. Let's see here. Hmm. Maybe I didn't click. I may have, I may have picked the wrong one. I'm sorry. Let me go back here. Oh, 418. <laughs> Okay, First Thessalonians 4.18. So, and it reads, uh, starting at 16, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Mm -hmm. And you really consider this is Paul's uh, answer to the Thessalonians about those who were grieving. He was telling them not to grieve like those who don't have any hope. So that's our hope, you know. Uh, it's a resurrection. It is uh, the lifespan that we have is a, will be a speck compared, less than a speck compared to eternity. And I just can't help but believe when, you know, when we finally are in that place, everything that we've gone through will seem like absolutely nothing, you know. Yeah. So we have that hope. And the other thing, too, is this. And I comfort myself with this fact to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And both of them died in Christ. So, you know, they are there with the Lord. And as, as Paul said, it's, it's far better, you know, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, which is far better, he said. He even went as far as to say that he was torn between the two, whether he, he should go to be with the Lord or to stay on earth so he could be as a service to the body. So when you couldn't consider that, you consider the thief on the cross and you know, Jesus telling him, today you'll be, be in paradise you really realize that it is not them we're grieving for. Right, right. We're grieving for our loss. We're grieving because we lost them. They're in, they're in bliss right now. You know? Yeah. They, you know, they've already begun the eternal part of their lives. Uh, they, they're waiting for their bodies to be rejoined with the spirit, but ultimately they've already, they've made it. They, they've crossed the finish line already, but it's us. We're, we're, you know, we're, we're mourning ourselves. We're not mourning the fact that somebody that we love so much is gone. Right. We're, we're, we're mourning that the, the love that they had for us is lost. <laughs> and, you know, and I thought about that, um, you know, even, even in, in this time, same time period, I lost, starting in 2017, my cousin that I got saved through, he died of cancer. And then um, Christy, then my, and then December of, of that year, my sister Jane, she died. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, then Sarah. But the, the thing that really hit me about, uh, about Christy and my cousin Thomas and Christy and my sister Jane was the people that talked to me all the time. I felt like the ones who loved me the most, and this is, it's like, Lord, what is going on here? The people who loved, the, the three people I felt that loved me the most I lost them. And so that in itself was almost like, it's almost as if this conspiracy from the enemy to just hurt me, you know, just to take everything away from me that's associated with love. But then again, I, I realized I have a whole lot of other people who still love me, but but they in particular were, you know, of course I saw Chrissy every day, but my, my sister Jane and my, and my cousin Thomas, they were the ones that would call me every week. 
uh, at least once a week, you know. And for that to be gone was a big was a big deal. But here again, they're in the presence of the Lord, and I don't know. I just think that the way this grief has been orchestrated in my life, because I I feel like this. It feels like a conspiracy. <laughs> the way this grief has been orchestrated in my life is still does not change the fact that God has orchestrated so many other positive things in my life. And I can tell you the number of things that are amazing, miraculous interventions that, has ha that have happened since that time that, are, that far outweigh all of the grief and all the trouble that I've gone through. So I've had this blend of amazing blessings from the Lord and amazing breakthroughs and everything else along with this amazing period of loss and, and really loss of people who love you. Yeah. yeah. You know, um, something else that we've talked about that I know a lot of people are dealing with right now is financial struggles and starting over. And I know that that's part of your story too. And I, I wonder if you could share a little bit to maybe offer some encouragement for people who are going through some hard times that way. Yeah, it's a, it's a whole different thing when you, you know, when you have income from two people and all of a sudden that one person is gone. Um, you know, it's, I don't even know how to address everybody's situation, but I can say this. I can't help but believe, you know, that the word of God is true. Uh, the Bible says that he will cause all grace to abound towards us so that always having all sufficiency in all things, we will have an abundance for every good word. And that's my prayer every day. You know, I believe that, you know, I, I am ultimately God's responsibility. It's him who told, he told me that if I would seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, that everything would be added to me. And that has been true. And he has provided for me in ways that, uh, that, that, are unimaginable. But what I will say this though, it, it is a wise thing for all of us to have life insurance. Mm -hmm. And it's obviously not for you, it's for those who, who leave behind and it can make all the difference in the world, without a doubt. That's great advice. Um, what, what, um, what would you say to people that are needing hope right now that, that they, Maybe they're feeling angry with God um, that that these things have happened in their life. What would you say to someone like that? Well, I would say the, the first posture that we must adapt is that God is God. That there is there is no there is no uh, there is nothing that anyone can accuse God of in anything. He is righteous in all of His ways. Um, the things that he allows, we don't understand those things. Um, I mean, I can imagine, can you imagine the early church when they have a deacon in their church and this guy is so amazing and so powerful that he goes from being a deacon to becoming a, a miracle working preacher. And of all the people in the world to be killed is this, this man named Stephen and he gets stoned to death. Can you imagine what they felt, the grief that they felt? But I think since uh, there was no indication at all that there was any anger in their heart because God allowed Stephen to be stoned. Think about James being killed with a sword by, uh, by Herod and, and Herod you know, throwing Peter in jail, planning on doing the same thing to him because he saw that it pleased the Jews to see that. But there was no indication at all that they accused God, that they showed any anger. Now, you have to understand, this is someone who loved, these are people who love God, and they were murdered for the gospel. So I say this, um, if they could look at their friends be murdered for the sake of the gospel, and if you notice, that they didn't miss a beat when it came to, to the ministry, they kept right on going. It's amazing. If they can do that, then that tells me that the, the posture that we must have is that we have to trust God in the middle of all these things, because there is no fault in him. And um, I think of where Jesus said, he talked about, the disciples came and they talked to, to him about uh, some people that, that Herod had mingled their blood with the sacrifices. And Jesus said, do you think they were more evil than other people because this happened to them? Or then he talked about a, a, a tower that had fell on a, on a, 
a bunch of people and they got killed. All she said, you think they were worse sinners than anybody else because that happened to them? So basically what he was saying was that when bad things happen to people, now he ultimately he in that situation, he said, unless you repent, you will so likewise perish. But I think that the message is still there is that what they went through wasn't associated with anything that they did wrong in particular, but it was something that, that happened. Uh, I, Rachel dying in childbirth, you know, uh, that all those things. I look when I whenever I read that, I would go, man, that's just Lord. Why? I mean, you know, mm-hmm. why did you let this happen? You know, you can look through the Bible and see so many situations where you have just asked yourself, why in the world did God allow that to happen? Well, here we are, and we are subject to the same heartache and disappointment and, and just unanswered questions and everything else. We just simply have to trust God. But I think that, you know, the one thing that, um, remember this, the one thing that we can, we can compare ourselves to Job, and compare ourselves to all of what he went through. Like I said, when I, come, when I stack up what I'm going through to what Job went through with the loss of all of his children, you know, lightning hit his cattle, burned him up, all these things that happened to him. And in short succession, one on the same day, all these bad messages, one after another. And when you look at the finality of all what Job went through, the Bible says this, that he did not accuse God wrongly or sin with his mouth. So I think that's a message to us. No matter what you find yourself in, do not accuse God wrongly of not not loving you, of not caring for you. Worship him and praise him and thank him. And basically say, Lord, in the middle of my trouble and all of what I'm going through, I worship you and I trust you. And everything that you said about yourself is true. And everything that you've said about your love for me is true. And I stand on that. And that alone is, I call it spiritual defiance. We defy the enemy. We we will not allow him to create the, I hate the word, use so much narrative. (laughs) We don't allow him. He doesn't get the stage. He doesn't get to be the one that's that's talking about and defining what's going on with us. We allow the word of God to define that for us. And we stand on that. And it's faith. Ultimately, it is faith. It is the same. It is the same logic that we use when we come to the conclusion that God has promised us that if we believe in Jesus, that we have eternal life. Well, we have to believe him that when we're going through these things, that he's faithful, that he's true, and that he ultimately has us. And if he says he's carried out grief and borne our sorrows, then he will do that. But everything that we've ever, everything that is associated with the God is activated by one thing. And that is believing what God said. And to me, that's what faith is. Simply believing what God says. Abraham believed God and was counted, it was accounted to him for righteousness. And when we believe God and take him at his word above everything we see and everything we want and everything we feel, when we exalt his word above everything and our feelings and we just simply take him at his word, that is faith. And that changes everything. It changes us inside. It changes our perspective and it changes the conditions of our lives also. I think about when they had toiled all night and fish and, and Jesus said, cast the net out. And they said, Lord, look, we fished all night long, but we didn't catch anything. He said, but, but nevertheless, because you said it, we'll try. Nevertheless, at your word, Lord, we'll do it. And when they cast the net out, they caught an enormous amount of fish. So many so that the net was breaking and when they had to get people to help them drag it back to land. Well, I, these things are written for our learning and they're written to teach us that we have to trust. It is, you know, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because he who comes to God must believe, first of all, you have to believe that he is. But you also have to believe that he's a rewarder, not a punisher. He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So when you diligently seek God through your tears and your heart is aching and you can barely lift your head up just to say, Lord, I'm hurting, but I trust you. And I just I just give every all my hurt, all my pain. I give everything over to you, Lord. But I say your word is true and everything you promised me is true. And I will declare that until the day I die. When we do that, we are making a declaration that we trust God above everything. And to me, ultimately, that is one of the manifestations manifestations of loving him with all of our heart, with all of our mind, 
with all of our strength and with all of our soul. And that's the first commandment. Yeah. So it is faith. We, it, it takes faith to come through heartache. It takes faith to come through disappointment. It takes faith to, to come through situations where you feel like, you know, the creator of heaven and earth has abandoned you. Uh, think about the people who prayed, believing that God would do a miracle and it didn't happen. Has God abandoned you because it didn't happen? No. He said he'll never leave you nor forsake you. So whatever and whatever happens, you know, um, encased in, in, in that whole statement, uh, I will never leave you nor forsake you, even until the end of the age. Well, if that is true, then there's no time that you've gone through anything where he has left you or he has forsaken you. So... That is an absolute truth. Uh, it's an absolute truth that I don't know the, what the individual outcomes will be for each person that applies that truth and believes in it. I don't even know that. But what I do know is that this is the only option that we have is to trust God, uh, that he is faithful and that he loves us, that he'll never leave us and that he'll never forsake us. Amen. That he hasn't left you, he hasn't forsaken you, and you can't listen to the, the voice of the enemy telling you that. Yeah. You mentioned trust, and and I think it's important for people to know, I think trust and faith are two very different things. You can only trust somebody that you come to know well, and I think God, from some of these situations that we where we're left, where we have no option, but to put our faith in him, that's where we learn to trust him because that's when we find his promises are true and, and that he follows through on everything that he ever says to us. So absolutely, the more we see him as trustworthy, the more our trust grows. So um, we, need, we learn through adversity, what we can't learn in the good times. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, you know, one of the things that uh, that uh, happened to me early on in my life, well, not really too much early on in my life, quite frankly, it was after we moved to Nashville. And uh, the Lord would use this negative situation to establish a principle in my life that would really change my life for the rest of my life. And that was, we had moved to Nashville. Uh, we had just signed an agreement uh, with Lawrence Creative Services, uh, we actually we had a deal with Milk and Honey Records, and we were just absolutely elated. And we went back to Richmond, Virginia, which is my hometown, you know, Sarah and I and all the kids. And we went back celebrating with my relatives all of what had happened for us, and uh, they were so happy for us, and playing demo tapes and different things and songs that we had done and what was coming up. And while I was in Richmond, this was in August, I'll never forget that. Uh, Ellen Raymer, who was at Lorenz Creative Services, called me at my mom's house. It's like, oh, wow, <laughs> he's calling me here. I wonder what in the world is going on. So he calls me. He says, Billy, um, I was working at Parkland Hospital before this, and uh, I had left my job, you know, with my new brand new career. And, and he said, can you get your job back? I said, uh, I said why, why do you ask that? And he said, because Zondervan absorbed milk and honey and Zonovan bought and dissolved Milk and Honey, and we don't know where Dan Cleary or where Mike DeMonico, where they're going to land, or even where they're going to be with the company. So effectively, your, your contract does not exist anymore. I can't tell you, oh my goodness, you're talking about a ton of bricks. Mm -hmm. That was one of the biggest ton of bricks that anybody ever dropped on me. I was so heartbroken and just so... I can I feel it all over me right now, just the way that I felt at that time. So it was time for us to go back to Nashville. And I was, uh, we headed out on I-64, come out of Richmond, Virginia, I-64 West. And as I got out on the highway, the Lord spoke to me. He said, begin, this is, I mean, it just came from nowhere. He said, what I want you to do is be, to look, begin at the beginning of your life. Now, I'm not, now I'm not, I didn't hear an audible voice, but I heard this in my spirit. These were instructions that I heard in my spirit to begin at the beginning of my life. Think back on everything that I've ever done for you, and, and I want you to thank me for it. 
I did. So I started thinking back and I said, well, thank you, Lord, that when I was in my mother's womb, uh, she, she was in a car accident and, and I was, she was thrown to the dashboard and I didn't die. And when I was uh, a toddler, I was in the middle of the street. My Aunt Barbara risked her baby getting me out of the middle of the street and saved my life. And when I was three years old, I got out of the car downtown Richmond, Virginia, and nobody, I didn't run into the street and somebody was just kind enough to come pick me up. Um, when I was hit at the age, well, I car at the age of 12 and you saved my life when the people who saw me get hit by that car knew that I was dead because there's no way that anybody could survive being knocked that high in the air by a car and coming back down, especially on your head. The fact that I didn't uh, have any any fatal, that, that it wasn't fatal, I didn't have any broken bones. And as I began to look through my life and look at all the wonderful things that God had done for me, even right down to why I was in Nashville in the first place, well, by the time I got to, from Richmond on I-64 West, by the time I got to, eight, to the 81 Junction South going towards Nashville, I was so full of joy, but I was also so full of faith. Because it's just like you said, it was a trust. After I, go, after I went through all those things, I said, wait a minute, Lord, you have, you, you've given me a formula to convince myself of one simple thing. You're trustworthy. Mm -hmm. you've, 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 you've caused me to, to recite all these events, Lord, so that I can show by my own mouth just how good you've been and just how trustworthy you have been. And Lord, I trust you. And I said, you, and then, then I realized this didn't happen by mistake. And, it did, and we're on course. You've told us to go in full-time ministry and we believe that's your word. And so we're going to stay on that course, Lord. We went back to Nashville. By the time I and went back in faith, I, I did not go back in despair. I just went back saying, okay, let's see where this is going because I know God's going to do something mighty. I just knew that he was. So we went back and um, we were supposed to go in and finish. Initially, we were going to finish... Uh, we had three songs that we had we had done, um, and we were supposed to finish those three songs completely. And I thought of an idea. We had another thing that God had given us incredible favor, and we had had concerts lined up all over the place based on three songs that we had sent out. The same ones that for demo for our recording contract, we had sent out to churches and they loved them and they'd invite us to come and sing. And I went back to, and I had an idea. We can, if we have this whole record, we can do this whole record. We'll have a whole record that we can perform on the road. The only thing is, instead of finishing these three strong songs of all the strings and all the added stuff, if we could get one, you know, a couple of days of tracking, we could track all 10 of these songs. We could have tracks to sing with. So I went back to John Elliott and I said, John, would you please go to Raymer and ask him if instead of just finishing these three songs, if he would spend the money that he's budgeted for that for us to go in and track the other seven songs. I said, then we'll have tracks. We won't, won't, won't have strings. We'll have all the good, goodies on it, but at least we have basic tracks that we can sing to. He said, Billy, I don't know, man. He said, I, I've never even heard of anybody doing anything like that. He said, I don't think he will, but I'll ask him. So he went to Raymer, and sure enough, Raymer said, yeah. So there we, there we were able to go into the studio to finish those seven songs. Now we've got 10 songs, uh, tracks on these new songs. The added plus of that was that we were able to now go out on the road. We were able to minister you know, with the same songs that we would have been using, minus the strings and all the other extras. The same songs that we would have been using if we had released a record anyway. Another, we were right on course with what we would have been doing anyway if we had released that record. And it was absolutely amazing. The favor God gave us, um, we traveled all over the place. It was absolutely amazing. Well, um, the Sunday after I arrived back in Nashville, Dan Cleary, who was our A&R director and who will become our producer also, we were at Belmont Church on Sunday morning at Belmont Church, and I walked up to Dan, and you know he looked at me. And I remember, this is right after the milk and honey deal falls apart. And he looks at me, and he go, and I said, he gets tears in his eyes. He said, "Man, I'm so sorry what happened." But I remember he, he took 
a one hundred dollar bill and stuck it in my pocket. He said, "If there's anything I can ever do, he said I will." So there we were, just simply going on about our business, doing the work of the kingdom, using what God had given us, which was these ten tracks, and we could go and and sing them all over the place. And um, I don't know how long it was after that that when everything, when all the dust settled, when who was going to be where? Dan Cleary became the head of A&R at Benson Records. Mm -hmm. And the first people that he signed when he became head of A&R was us. Wow. So you know, here again, I mean, we could have, you know, been in despair and just could have accused God, could have just said, I'm through with this. I'm going to go back home, go back to my job. But what we did was we focused on moving ahead with the call and moving ahead with the kingdom. And because of that, it opened the doors for us to be blessed abundantly. And I will say another thing also, which is astonishing to me, without any booking agent, without any of those things, that year when we went out in full-time ministry, we made three times more, and just, just in love offerings. We didn't charge anybody anything. But just in love offerings, we made three times more than I had ever made in my whole life. That was astonishing by itself, you know? So there are blessings in obedience and there's there are blessings in trusting God. Take it, take inventory of your life. Look at what he's done. Go over your life and look at all the wonderful things that he's done for you and concentrate on those things and realize he's the same God who did those things. He is. And he won't change you. He won't, he won't forsake you. you know? I mean, the time is coming for all of us. Uh, I don't know when it is. I mean, that's be a time when you know unless the lord comes back before that time there's gonna be a time when i close my eyes and go on to be with the lord uh, but what i'm going to do is until that time i'm going to be i'm going to be faithful to him i'm going to put my trust in him and you know whatever happens just keep trusting him and keep believing him. yeah awesome as you're speaking I'm, i think of um king david and he often wrote um he would encourage himself with God's Absolutely. goodness and, and the things that God had done in the past. And, and that's such a vital thing for us to do that. And the, it says scripture is written to give us hope and encouragement and all the stories of saints that have gone before us in like Job and Joseph and all these people that suffered, you know, they're a reminder that it, it, just because you love love the Lord doesn't mean that you're not going to have times of suffering, but that's true. you can look at how faithful he is. And at the times when you don't feel his nearness, that's when you reclaim his promises that he is near and he'll never forsake you. And um, that's, I think you just touched on something that's really vital to getting through the hard times in life is just remember that God hasn't brought you this far to fail you now. Amen. Amen. That's right. That's true. Yep. Wow. Without a doubt. What else would you say, Billy, to anyone else? That is there anything else you'd like to say to people that might be hurting this year? Well, I would just say God sees you, and um, and you know, and this scripture is, you know, it really it, it talks about temptation, but I apply it differently. It says that there's no temptation taking us that's not common to all men. With every temptation, God makes a way of escape so that we can bear it. And I, I, I really expand that to there is no heartache. There's no heartache that that uh, that the Lord doesn't know. He, uh, uh, he's acquainted with our grief. He, he feels the things that we feel. He knows the, the, the pain that we feel and all those, all those things. So I mean, he really is able to comfort us in the middle of that. We really just have to have to trust in him and trust in him that he really is able and completely willing to comfort our hearts and to bring us through those situations. Yeah, for sure. Well, thank you so much. Um, would you like to um, pray for everybody before we go? Yes, I would do that. Yes. Okay. Heavenly Father, we just come to you in Jesus' name, and we thank you for all of your goodness to us, Lord. And Lord, we want to declare right now that you are perfect, wonderful, awesome in all of your ways and in all of your doings. Lord, there is no one who can reply against you. There is no rule, no law, no, there is nothing that can be against you, Father, because you are perfect in what you do. 
So we come to you with that trust, Lord. And we worship you and we glorify you and we exalt you that we have access to your throne of grace and our weakness and in our hurt and our pain and our anguish and in our grief. And we come to you, Father, believing you and asking you to help us. Help us, Lord. You see our hearts and you know how we feel. And Lord, it's only you, Lord, who can reach into our spirit and comfort us. Father, it's only you that can truly bear our grief and carry our sorrows. And so right now, Father, we place our faith in your word and what you've told us. And we believe you, Lord, and we trust you that you love us. We trust you, Father, that you care for us. We trust you, Father, that you care about the way that we feel. We trust you, Father, that your heart is moved when we hurt. That we're not alone. That you, that you hurt for us, Lord, and we thank you for that, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that, uh, that Jesus is acquainted with grief, acquainted with our grief, Lord. And Father, we just thank you right now, and we believe you, that you hear us. And we believe, Father, that because you hear us, that you will grant us petition that we have and that you will be our comfort. We thank you, Father. And I thank you right now that we will see new blessings. We will see new joys, Lord. We'll see new reasons to hope in you, Father, because we have breath. And we worship you and we glorify you with that breath. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Billy, for coming and sharing. I, I'm sure you're going to touch many hearts and bless many people. Well, it's a blessing to be here. Thank you for including me. Sure. I really appreciate that. Okay. And um, hopefully, um, Billy is going to be putting together a little mini concert for everyone, if we can pull, pull that off. So that'll give you something to look forward to. So. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> All right, Billy. Thank you so much. God bless you. All right. God bless All you. Right. Bye-bye now. All right.